Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Just for the hell of it! Welcome to the Fish Nerds. This is Clay Gross. We're going to give you a little uh, extra Fish Nerds throwback this week because I don't have time to make a new show for you. But this is actually one of our, I think, one of our most fun episodes. This features uh, zombie bait, and we talk about all kinds of crazy fishing baits people could use. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to throw in a little extra contest. I have uh, brand new Fish Nerds fleece line beanies. It just came in today, and I want to give one away. So if you call the Fish Nerds hotline, 607-378-FISH, and tell us, your grossest bait story. Give us like a one-minute story. Tell us your name, where you're from. Uh, we'll put all those uh, answers in a hat, play them on the next show, and tell you who won a brand new, super warm Fish Nerds beanie. And of course, it includes free shipping. Uh, but I think you're going to enjoy the show. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in Kansas, so hopefully I'll get a new show out before I leave for Kansas. I'm going to be speaking at Emporia State University. Should be a lot of fun. Follow the Fish Nerds Facebook page for details if you're in the area and you want to come out and uh, and see what we're doing. I, I don't even know what we're doing yet, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, and that's it. So enjoy this gross bait episode. Just honor your family by fishing with bait. Welcome to the Fish Nerds. It's the latest about fish, fishing, and eating fish. That's usually funny. I won't look it again, usually funny. Okay, it's always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. Uh, Brad Knight, Forest Wood Cup champion. And here are the nerds. Hey, I'm Dave. And I'm Clay. Anything is a fair game, it's a good bet that we're going to vomit a little bit in our own mouth while talking about baits this week. Ugh. <laughs> God, what a what a way to start the whole thing! Jeez, I know, but you know, it's it's funny thing about being guys who use bait is sometimes it's gross. It that is true. Although it's no gross grosser than cleaning a fish. I mean, it's well, the same. Or what's the grossest bait you've ever fished with? No, uh, the grossest bait I've ever fished with was catfish bait, and I had made up some like chicken liver blood bait. Was it worth it? Uh, no, no, no. God, it, it sounds terrible. My uncle Ronnie is big on making his own baits. He does that. He'll take like whatever dead thing he has, put it in a jar, sit in the sun for all summer, and then bring it out fishing. And he can't wait to like open it up and put it on a hook. <laughs> and, I, and I've been with him when he does this, and he catches nothing. <laughs> oh God! Yeah, it repels the fish. Is there any? What's the worst bait you've ever seen used? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's pretty much it. I think. Uh, I was watching YouTube videos today about homemade traps and uh, found a guy who uses muskrats and he puts them in a bucket with some water in the sun until like the flesh is falling off the bones yeah and then he puts them in his traps for his for i'll tell you later what he's using them for but and he just on the video he just grabs them and he goes and you just kind of pull the head off and you get make sure you get some front arm skin in there and you just pack it in the little bait bucket <laughs> and, oh, completely nauseating oh that is that sounds completely nauseating and i could not look away <laughs> i was just like wow that's awful i'm gonna stare right at it god that's yeah. horrible that is horrible yeah for sure <laughs> okay well, we should probably start the show then. Yeah, hey, we should. Bait. What is bait? Well, bait is live. Often, live bait swimming around, wiggling around. But that's not always the case. Because you also have bait that never was alive, or at least wasn't in an animal form. Let's say dough bait for carp. Corn is one of the best bait ever for carp. And frankly, I've caught a lot of bluegill and trout on corn. Then there's the synthetics. What about Berkeley? All the jars of Berkeley stuff. There's gulp. There's power bait. There is 
all those synthetic plastics. Are those bait? Are those not bait? Some kind of hybrid? Well, today's show is all about bait, and I was lucky enough to get a hold of Matthew Borowski. By trade, I'm an electrical engineer. I've been doing electronics for about 12 years. I got started in the uh, the Air Force uh, working on aircraft electronics. And um, after the military, I went to college to get my, my master's degree in electrical engineering. And um, I have been working full-time also as an electrical engineer here in the Boston area. I'm really into embedded systems, which is how we make you know, small micro devices move and, you know, make sound. It's like, I can, I can program it to do almost anything. Oh, this guy could write his own ticket. Imagine a young guy in Boston with the skills of an electrician, electrical engineer. Uh, he really could write his own ticket. So what do you think he does? Do you think he's, he builds satellites for NASA or maybe some military aircraft? Uh, no, he works at a company called Zombate. What's Zombate? A portmanteau of the words uh, zombie and bait, and essentially true to its name, uh, it is a device which uh, is intended to take dead bait fish and make them swim like they're alive again. <laughs> that is right. Reanimating the dead. But we are talking dead mackerel, dead herring, those kinds of things. How does something like this get started? Well, first of all, you need some cash. And this is how they went about it. Every dime that's gone to the company has been our own money. Uh, Kickstarter is a platform that we're using to uh, launch our first round of production, uh, which is a little more complicated than how we make them now. Um, essentially it comes down to, we're looking to get some money to get it into a manufacturing shop, which is out of my basement finally, which is where they're currently made <laughs> and, uh, and get them done professionally made and, and get them, um, you know, to a much higher quality and a higher process standard and begin to sort of scale up and get people testing them and using them more in the water with a much, uh, much more reliable product, um, that they're going to love using hopefully. Oh, we would love using those. I would think. Uh, anything that's kind of nerdy. Now, Matt couldn't do this alone. Uh, he has a business guy. He has another guy who's been a tuna fisherman in the Northeast for a long time. And then I got a sense this is his partner in crime, this other guy. So remember, Matt does electronics and a friend of mine, he's a mechanical engineer from uh, Worcester Polytechnical Institute, came a, uh, you know, a partner of the company. And uh, together we have made, you know, the physical structure to fit into a dead fish and now the electronics to make the dead fish function. Electronics. Electronics and saltwater. That is a trick. But you know what? They did some prototypes and they worked. And then we got really excited about it and it came down to, all right, let's make this thing smaller. Let's make it more powerful. Let's change some functionality to make it easier to use. And we just got going on it and we just haven't stopped since. You know, if Clay got a hold of one of these, he'd be reanimating everything. But uh, these guys started with a common fish. I had a uh, frozen mackerel that I was given by our third co-founder, who's a fisherman out of Maine. And he has supplied a frozen frozen fish and he came down for the day. We watched it swim. We watched it move and we watched all the tail wiggling around. We, we started to get ideas about, okay, this is this is possible. Our third co-founder, Rink, uh, he had the idea. He's been a tuna fisherman out of Maine for 40 years or so. And uh, he came to me one day over dinner and he said, uh, he kind of held up his hand and said, can you make a dead fish do this? And he kind of waved his hand back and forth. I had no idea why he wanted to do that, why he wanted to do that. He knew I was into robotics and we started getting into it. And next thing you know, we had the prototype going. Which one of you yelled, it's alive? <laughs> I think that was Chris. He's a, a buddy of ours. He's been helping us out uh, on the side. Yeah, somebody had to. Somebody <laughs> yeah. had to. <laughs> the first one was a tank. It was a well-done prototype, but it was just too big. We've used it so far in uh, Mahaden. Uh, we've used it in Ballyhoo, Herring, Mackerel, um, and I believe uh, Pogi, Bunker, they call it too. Bunker and pogey. Uh, just think of all the different kinds of fish you could use this in. And I asked him, is, is this the kind of thing you just jam into the fish's gut? I mean, really just open up their mouth and jam it into the dead fish. And he said there are, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Some guys like to break the back. Some some want to uh, 
to debone it, uh, to make it a little more compliant. It's tied to your hook, so it's retrievable. When you get your hook back, you get the device back. You can put your hook anywhere in the fish versus a live fish. You're kind of limited to where you put your hook without killing it. Well, this thing's already dead, so it doesn't matter if you kill it again. Oh, now we're getting into a whole weird world. Just think of the implications of fishing with live bait, only it's not live. You can do different things. Uh, one of the examples actually came from a surprising source uh, via the Internet. We've had a lot of interest from Europe uh, about the product from the Kickstarter campaign. And we didn't know this, but there are countries in Europe where fishing with live bait is, is a felony. Um, and you actually, you know, we're getting responses back and people's telling us, you know, how would the game wardens think about this? And we don't know how to answer the question because we never thought about that before. You know, we've always positioned ourselves as being a product, which is there. If you can't use live bait, well, you use zombie. bait. But uh, we're finding out now that in Europe, you know, zombie bait might be the best thing that they could use because live bait is simply not an option for them. We have a contingency of folks in Finland that love the podcast. We have hats that say fish nerds on it. We keep getting pictures of them with hat. We can't understand a word they're saying because <laughs> uh, it's all Finnish. Sure. But um, they have the picture. They have the fish nerds hat on. They're holding up all sorts of fish. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to reach out to you on this. Uh, after We've after had a this. ton of German anglers reach out to us. I think Germany is one of the biggest ones where they can't use live bait. And, you know, honestly, I mean, uh, it, it's great to hear this kind of response because it, it gives us a different look at it you know we don't have the exposure to their markets but now that we kind of see you know hey I, I they see what we're doing and they can reply back with how it benefits them well that helps encourage us to to, to keep going too you know because we could be the best option that they have now i normally i i grew up not saltwater fishing so typically i i fish for freshwater fish like bass and things like that and the idea of sticking one of these six, seven inch things down a gut of bait just doesn't seem right. But we definitely are going to scale down. Uh, the one we made so far is meant for a standard size bait fish, which is used uh, primarily in, I guess, like tuna fishing, striped bass fishing, bill fishing. Um, but it's it's a bait fish approximately six inches and above, six to 12, six to 14, somewhere in that region. But that's only because we've only we've made it for that size. You know, obviously we can take what we have and, and, and modify components and scale it down. There's no reason why we couldn't get it down to uh, to a bay fish, which is approximately maybe three to four inches, maybe smaller. This fish isn't going to swim away, away from predatory fish. It's going to just kind of hang out there. It's going to be there ready to be eaten versus uh, maybe a live fish might want to swim away from predatory fish. Well, in theory, you could fish any bait fish anywhere, which is, that's always kind of intrigued me. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, so I love to experiment. And uh, I mean, if I were really out there, I would want to try bait from the Indian Ocean. I'd want to try bait from the Mediterranean, uh, from literally anywhere and put it in the Atlantic Ocean or into a, a harbor and see if you can confuse a fish enough to be <laughs> like, what? what is that swimming here? That doesn't belong here. Just animate anything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And there's also some really clever stuff we can do with uh, electric fields. And you could probably rig them to explode too, right? Uh, like an inspector gadget kind of thing. I don't know. Exactly. Uh, so the fish bites <laughs> it and then just boom. Yeah. I think maybe you want to use uh, some kind of, uh, I guess, an incendiary, maybe a, a, a grenade or something for that, probably. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you'd want it to, you'd, you'd want a gas component so it would float. After yeah. I, I don't think you want to blow this thing up. <laughs> yeah. ho ho hopefully it's a product you, uh, you end up using <laughs> in many, many bait fish and you can, you know, bring as many, uh, swimming dead back to life as you, you can think of. We get called uh, robo fish. We get called uh, zombie fish. I mean, we're calling it zombie, uh, but we we hear the spectrum of jokes about this thing. It, it's you know we the one thing we always hear a lot is uh, you know you guys should go on Shark Tank, you know, because you're in fishing and sharks and the, the whole thing. And, and so uh, you know, if, if I had a dollar every time I heard that, we'd probably would be funded fully by now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we say reanimate your bait. You know, we say uh, the swimming dead sometimes. It's a fun industry to be in. The, the name's clever, too. So it's it lends itself very well to a fun industry, a fun product, a fun brand. Possibly if your child's goldfish uh, expires, you know, you can. Oh. There we go. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> you can bring bubbles back from the dead. <laughs> Do you think you could reanimate a dead worm? You know, it could be done. It would be done differently than a motor, though, because they're such a elongated species. Mm -hmm. um, they do use um, small little air bladders to to make uh, like human arm tendons out of, uh, essentially to simulate muscle 
uh, you can use air bladders and you actually could use a, a, a few small uh, air manifolds and if you were to to inject a small amount of air into each one at the right time you can make a, a worm wiggle Oh, that would be awesome. (laughs) You may have to do that. (laughs) So another thing I I was interested if you could reanimate uh, from the fishing world is uh, dead marriages. That one, probably not. Uh, You're probably going to want to spend less on our product and and more on flowers and other other types of uh, yeah pro- products to give your spouse <laughs> i know but you know the, the the fishing widows that have to deal with that yeah it's fishing is an affliction from what i've, I've heard it's a, it's a it's a passion and what's great about i mean i i've fished before but never to this level and uh, we find out that our customers are, are, are you know they're uh they're self-identifying i mean you don't you don't get to sell a product that you know cures snoring and people don't self-identify as a snorer right but right. people self-identify as a fisherman and you can tell that it's in their blood it's in their <laughs> it's in their, their 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 DNA you know they're they're programmed to catch fish and it's it's uh, it's awesome to have that level of excitement over something that is just a you know a, a product but people love it because it it helps their passion you know <laughs> People who are fish nerds, they know it, you know, <laughs> and they, yeah. they come up and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm a fish nerd. <laughs> well, I, I, I think Zombates is about as fish nerdy as you get. Uh, <laughs> I think so. I think I'll so. I'll have to have you over to the basement in the, uh, in the engineering workshop sometimes. You can take a look. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, exactly. And then um, kudos to your to your wife for supporting this this uh, affliction. And hopefully you can uh, make it pay off. So then you guys take nice vacations and stuff. Yes. I, I owe my wife, Yulia. I a very long vacation wherever she wants to go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she, if it wasn't for her, I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do because I do work full time and I also work on this in my spare time. And, you know, she's just very supportive. She, she takes care of me with things I don't have to think about and helps me automate my life a little bit so I can, I can focus on, on working on this product. Uh, no, actually I, I do have a, a young daughter. She's uh, almost three months old. So, um, oh, so you're just starting on all this, yeah? I am, yeah. And I, she actually has a she has a zombie onesie that I, I bought for her, so she's uh, <laughs> also part of the the fan club. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome! Well, congratulations on that. Three months that's not very that's not very old. Actually, we 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 uh, our last fishing tournament that we showed zombie off of was in Nantucket in September, and we got back on a Sunday, and my my wife delivered two days after that. So oh. we actually were on the ferry coming back, and a day later she went into labor. So it was quite the. Uh, Quite the story. We still have the the uh, the ticket from the ferry that has the day before my daughter's birthday. So, oh, your wife is a saint. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> she is. That's great. Yeah, that is really great. Well, congratulations. Uh, Zombate is now uh, live for pre-orders on Kickstarter. And uh, to make it very simple to to view us and view our video and see what we're doing, uh, we, we redirected all of our website traffic over to there. So if you go to www.zombate.com, that's uh, Z-O-M-B-A-I-T.com, uh, it'll bring you right to our Kickstarter link. And it's definitely kind of a strange platform, I think, for people to understand. It's it's crowd, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding is a way that people can contribute um as a crowd, as a, as a mass of people who are interested in a product to help bring it to life. And uh, really what we're doing now is we're, uh, we're taking pre-orders now and what these are going to do is help us fund the first production run so the people that support the campaign will be the first ones to ever use Zombie um, in the world. I mean, we've used prototypes, but they've only been good for so long and now it's time to actually make the product that will be in stores and, and available. And uh, the Kickstarter campaign is the first chance that they have to, to help us out and, and, and use their own Zombie. Um, and actually it's kind of a, a interesting thing, but the more orders we get, the faster we can make the product happen. Uh, cause the, the costs of production are actually quite high. You have to pay for metal tools. You've got to pay for all of the setup costs, the labor, the inventory. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. So if we're able to, uh, to cover those costs faster, then that means that we can get into production faster and hopefully have people fishing with them by the summer. That's definitely our goal. Um, and, and, you know, if, if people support us, it also kind of shows that, Hey, we're not just, you know, being funded by somebody who has money, we're being funded by people who love what we're doing. And honestly, that's the best validation you can get is that people who like your product and want to use it support you enough to say, here, here's, you know, here's a little bit of money now. Uh, I want the first product. I love what you guys are doing and keep going. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's this relationship that cuts out so many middlemen because it's direct, you know, 
design and engineers all the way to, to the product users. And, and really, if this thing, uh, you know, goes and gets funded and, and we're successful, it's, it's the best marriage you can ask for uh, between, you know, the, the consumer and the producer. Yeah, the uh, Internet is unbelievable that way. I am impressed by it every day. Uh, it's, I think, more important as a public utility than any, nearly anything else we have just because well, of that. I'll tell you what, crowd crowdfunding actually predates the internet. If you think about the uh, Statue of Liberty, uh, that actually was given to us by the French, but the French did not pay for the pedestal that the Statue of Liberty uh, now resides on. And um, New York, uh, the, the governor at the time, I believe it was Grover Cleveland, said, uh, I, I'm not paying for this pedestal. And uh, so other, other cities, I think Boston was one of them, stepped up to say, we'll pay for the pedestal. And, uh, you know, New York being New York, they said... Uh, you know, no, wow, I don't want that to happen. So we actually went off and they solicited funds through the newspaper at the time, and people contributed uh, whatever they could, and they ended up raising, I think it was like $150,000, which is equivalent to uh, almost $7 million today's dollars. And they actually crowdsourced the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. A lot of people don't know that, uh, but it's actually, a, it's actually a true story, and it's, it's one that you know, kind of helps give crowdfunding a little bit of credibility because it's not just uh, us asking for money on the Internet. It's, it's a way of... Uh, funding something from people who are interested by it. It's like the American way. I mean, this is, you can't get more American you, than this. You can't, uh, yeah, you can't get more American than, than the Statue of Liberty. That's no. for sure. Nicely yeah. done. Well, you're yeah. all kinds of nerd, aren't you? I am a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm amongst friends here. <laughs> Special thanks to Matt. Really appreciate you coming on the show. This segment was overproduced by me, Dave. If you liked the way it was done, leave a comment on our Facebook page. The Facebook, our Facebook fans have given us questions. Well, we've given them questions, Dave. Well, sorry. That's right. They've given us the answers. Yeah, bait answers. Yeah. Can I just tell you, by the way, I am so happy with the way Facebook's been with us lately. And, and by the way, if you're not on the Fish Nerds podcast group, it's a private Facebook group, you're missing out on half of everything we do. Mm. So if you're already on the Fish Nerds page... With 13,000 others, you probably aren't seeing our stuff much. But if you get on the Facebook group, just, just search for Fish Nerds Podcast Group, uh, you'll find all the action happening in there. Man, we post stuff up on there, and immediately our fans are there to like support us and give us what we need and share pictures and stories, and we're just so happy that they're all right there. So tonight, we're talking about, about baits. And so I thought it'd be fun to put some polls up on there and surveys and see what people um, are saying. <laughs> Tonight I asked, what is everyone's go-to bait? And, and what do you think the most common ones, Dave? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen it. So I would say the most common go-to bait has got to be worms. Worms. It's a good guess. Yeah. yeah. And that was right. You know, the vast majority said worms. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, second most? Second most has got to be minnows. It is live minnows, right? Yeah. yeah what about good. number three? Let's say you do three. Number three for live bait? Mm hmm. Crawfish. Crawfish for number five. Oh, number five, for God's sakes. Yeah. yeah. I, I take it back. Uh, yeah, number five. But, <laughs> but they were tied with number four, which was mackerel. Mackerel? Yeah. Number three was waxworms. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So it was pretty great. Lots of good reaction there. We got other things too. Um, what is your favorite live bait, Dave? Uh, I guess I would have to say the night crawler. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Pretty near anything. Yeah, you pretty much hook one of those on, toss it out, and just kind of let it do its thing. Yeah, but man, we got lots of answers. We got squid, sandworms, snapper, blues, bunker, mealworms, eels, green crabs, trout worms, gummy wow. worms, maggots, <laughs> houses. <laughs> One of the interesting things that I didn't realize when I moved out here from the Midwest to New England is the names of the different sizes of night crawlers. What, what do you have in, out in the Midwest? The, we don't have sizes like that. It's just small, medium, large. Oh. <laughs> and, and out here, small would be trout worms. Trout worms, yeah. Yeah, which I never use. <laughs> Those are the, the the red worms. Yeah, they're actually red worms. So trout worms are red worms. And back in Indiana, they, we just called them red worms. That's what those right. were. Um, so yeah, trout worms are red worms. And then the next size up, which is actually just small night crawlers. What are they called? 
They're called Dillies. Dillies, yeah. yeah. They have them right on the right on the container. Dillies. Yeah, I actually like those the best. Yeah, and yeah. because you don't have to chop them up or anything, and they're just kind of the perfect size. So yeah, yeah. we're we're pro Dillies. Pro, well, plus you get fifteen in a box, right? So. Yeah, you get more and um, <laughs> Dillies to catch kibbies. That's right. And yeah. for for those uh, uh, not in the region, kibbies are sunfish. So yeah. And then, and then the big ones are called uh, night crawlers. Yeah, they, <laughs> or, or Canadian crawlers. Canadian crawlers. Canadian crawlers, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and so. what's and what's interesting too in our area in New England, um, in New Hampshire at least, worms are not native. Earthworms are not native in New Hampshire, and it's because the when the ice sheets came in, it wiped out everything, including so, the worms, including the worms. So in, anytime you see worms around here, they're introduced worms. Well, it's good to know. Yep. And you can you can really tell by their accents where they're from. <laughs> but where do you suppose the red worms are from? We know the crawlers are from Canada. Well, they probably aren't from Canada, to tell you the truth. They Not- have to be. It says it right on the container. <laughs> I think they're maybe grown there now. But um, I would not be surprised if they came up from the south. Um but red worms, I don't know. Red worms are awful, awfully often, geez, associated with um, manure piles. And, right. and they're super common. They are super common. And what's great is I actually in the summer like to go with red worms um, because I can leave them in my car and they won't completely just dissolve. Mm-hmm. And uh, because they can yeah. handle high temperatures, you don't even need to refrigerate those. Well, that's really good to know because I have a habit. Of uh, leaving worms in my car for months, <laughs> right? For months, uh, it's the worst. <laughs> yeah, it is the worst. I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of sticks with you. All right. So then I asked, uh, "How do you hook your minnows, Dave? How do you hook your minnows?" Oh, see, that's very interesting. So it all depends on how I am fishing. So if okay. the if, how about it for fish, <laughs> <laughs> so if the fish are in cover in deep cover, Mm -hmm. right? I will hook Mm -hmm. them in the mouth because when you do that, it forces the minnow to swim downward because the weight of the minnow pushes it nose down. If, however, yes, is that true? It is true. Okay. All right. (laughs) And if the fish are in sort of mid water to top of the water, you hook them in the tail. And then that way the fish struggle and they go tail up and they swim up and away. Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, it all depends. It all depends on, on if you're, if you want your minnow to go down or you want your minnow to go up. Interesting. Up. I, uh, okay. So, so the big response, I mean, we, there was three, three possible real surprises there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, most people just hook it directly through the back near the dorsal fin. Yeah. That, that is the third choice for sure. Yeah. Yep. And uh, do you remember ice fishing with, with Tom Tebow from BIP Outdoors? I do remember ice so fishing. So he had a way, very complicated way. He hooked them so that the hook was next to the dorsal, but through the skin and out again at a particular angle. Because when the fish hit, they always hit from a certain angle and he got more hook sets that way. Yeah. And he was specifically targeting, I think, chain pickerel in that I, scenario. I, I think so. And how many did we catch that day? <laughs> Zero. Zero. Well, we got one. I think after after the after the radio crews left, we got one. Oh, so, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So not a great day. I don't think it matters that much. It probably I think, doesn't. I, I think when you're ice fishing, the fish just don't care. Yeah, they're just happy. And they oh, find good it. food. It's right there. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then some recommended if you're ice fishing, let's say you've got enough traps, you know, out, you would vary your way your hooks are in to see what the fish like that day. Oh, well, that's always a good plan to uh, experiment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just hook them in the face. <laughs> yeah. You you just do them right in the face. Right in the face. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty rugged. It is rugged. So then I asked, does anyone buy their bait at the supermarket? And if so, what do they buy? Oh, good question. Yeah. Cause I'm always curious. I, every time I have the supermarket, I'm walking around going, man, I bet that'd be good bait. I bet that'd be good bait. <laughs> Do you remember chumming with macaroni with me? I do, and we even had a video camera, didn't we? We did. We were we had uh, we were fishing for whitefish, 
and we Googled it, and a lot of people chime with macaroni noodles. So <laughs> we tried it. Uh, we did draw in a uh, lake trout, but we did not see any any sign of white fish. That's right. So you heard it here first. Use macaroni to catch lake trout. That would go nuts. <laughs> yeah. And we're not talking craft macaroni, I don't think. I think you were using just regular macaroni. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the cheese, the cheese powders for us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> After we catch no fish. Well, and you also did, since we're on the supermarket subject, sardines. I, I love, uh, one of the coolest things I ever did was I took a can of sardines uh, on a string and I dropped it down about 70 feet under the ice. And I had an underwater camera there. And I, and I kind of shook the can out, I had it on a string. And then I left the camera down, and I could see dozens and dozens of little tiny yellow perch coming in, chewing up um, all these all the sardines. Mm. And then these three huge lake trout. Now, they're huge compared to these tiny uh, yellow perch. I don't know how big they were. <laughs> but these three big lake trout came in, and like dogs eating, eating dog chow, just started gobbling up the oh, sardines. Oh, that's really cool. And it was so cool. And of course... Did I have a hook with a giant a giant hook ready with a big piece of bait ready to go? No, nope. No. <laughs> All I could do was sit and watch these fish gobble up the sardines. And that was, by the way, in Silver Lake, the worst lake in New Hampshire. It, <laughs> it is the most evil, worthless lake I, in New Hampshire. I hate that freaking lake. I don't All understand right. that lake. Anyway. Yeah. So what do you think um, our fan said was their favorite supermarket bait? Um, dough balls. You know what? No one said dough balls. Huh. Yeah. Maybe it's time of day. Maybe the dough balls guys are sleeping. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. What did they say? Uh, Ron Bellamy says uh, he knows guys who use shrimp, chicken livers, shrimp and chicken livers for bullheads. Mm. Uh, Jed Lush says he uses shrimp for ice fishing for chum eaters. Huh. Uh, Josh Porter from California says squid and shrimp. Those are these are kind of obvious ones. Uh, and James Frank says, ditto on Josh. So uh, <laughs> we kind of all agree with them. I, you know, what's funny about the shrimp and stuff is, of course, that's going to work. <laughs> Just because it's shrimp. Everybody it's loves shrimp. shrimp. Yeah, I'm kind of looking for the, you know, like a little more outlandish stuff. So if you have a way of using supermarket stuff for fishing, let us know. We know that fish works. But how about besides the obvious? Right. We'd love to kind of see what people have to say about that. Well, and there's a video that I saw the other day. I'll find it and post it in the show notes. A guy did a uh, – he's, he's actually a guy we need to get on the show because he's like us, only he does video stuff. And he does lots of weird challenge things. Oh, and cool. And he, he challenged his friend. They were on a golf course. And his friend was fishing with Senko worm, mm -hmm. you know, those big rubber worms. Yeah. And he fished with candy. And he tried gummy worms, and that didn't work. But he ended up catching like a two or I think almost a three-pound bass on a Twizzler. Really? Yeah, a red Twizzler. And why not, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty dang close to plastic, that's for sure. It, it is for sure. Now, remember someone told us, oh, uh, Sean Tibbetts mm -hmm. is big on no bananas, right? Oh, God. And, and other people have said, you know, if you get banana on your bait – um, you won't catch any fish. Mm. So that's another challenge. Cutting banana peel into bait and see if you can catch a fish with that. Oh, that would be, I bet that just, would work. Just prove the banana theory entirely. And <laughs> shove, it, <laughs> shove it in Sean's face. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Better if you catch a big old tuna on a banana. Oh, that Blow would be his awesome. mind. <laughs> All right. So then on the Fish Nerds page, not the group, I asked... Do you refuse to fish with bait and why? Uh, and you get a lot of like, you know, people use whatever works, but I, I wanted to see uh, who would not use bait. Mm. So uh, our friend Frank up there says, I don't refuse to use bait, just prefer not to for reasons of honor. Honor. <laughs> honor. <laughs> yeah. What is, is it like, like he's an Asgardian or something? He's like, well, I think he's a ninja. <laughs> oh, a ninja. Yeah. Yes. I see. I'll just honor your family by fishing with bait. <laughs> so <laughs> for all you ninjas out there. And I have friends who are hardcore fly fishermen. The idea of putting a worm on a hook just is like, no way. Never going to happen. <laughs> Which is funny because they'll put dead chickens all over their hooks. They, it's an interesting point you make. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they so put all sorts of. Fur. Yeah, yeah. All sorts yeah. of dead stuff. Yeah. Just not worms. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, but it, it's really funny and interesting. And I have no honor. <laughs> it was funny. I was thinking back to our conversation last week with um, with uh, Jerry Hamza, and uh, I asked the question. I said, "So you really wouldn't fish in a place where you know every time you're going to catch fish?" Mm-hmm. And he said, "No." And I'm and I could not. I, I listened back to the interview to make sure I asked that properly. And I can't come to terms with his answer <laughs> because if I knew every single time I was going to catch fish, that's where I would fish every single time. Yeah, I know. I would never get tired of it. Nope. I'm looking for that spot right now. I, yeah. If you know that spot, if you're tired of the spot that always catches fish, send me the GPS coordinates <laughs> and I am there and I will never fish anywhere else again. <laughs> I <Yeah>. know. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I thought that was a crazy, crazy uh, response as well. Yeah. Uh, Travis Rocket. What a great name. Uh, he said he can fish better and faster and catch more with artificials uh, in freshwater. Mm. I've had that experience. I have too. I have too. There are those certain times where for some reason they want a red piece of plastic with a bright purple tail. I once was crappie fishing in Derry, New Hampshire on top of a dam in a thunderstorm. <laughs> and I was, I was fly fishing with a fly I made myself. It was just a green piece of string tied to a hook. That's my very best fly. That's all I can do. Yeah. And the crappies couldn't get enough of it. Isn't that weird? As, as fast as I can get that in the water, I can get a fish out of the water. So there are times. Yeah. You know? But overall, I'm telling you, when nothing else works, bait seems to work. Yeah, exactly. And um, certainly, I, I also love the experience. You know, people say, I love the experience of the fly, you know, and the, and yeah, the, me too. And the beautiful, yeah, me, me too, when it works, the beautiful yeah. roll cast or the beautiful whatever cast, the side, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I equally enjoy the feeling of bait fishing when you're at night for like bullheads or mm-hmm. catfish or carp and the line moves and then it drops. And then it moves yeah. again and then it drops. And then it takes off. That's it's awesome. fun. Yeah. It's fun. You know, it's all fun. That's the trick because I actually don't care. Yeah, that's true. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also, I mostly just care about I want to catch a fish. And, you know, if, if I was I fishing with – I was fishing in New Orleans uh-huh. um, down there and, uh, and we were fishing. We were throwing these spoons and we're not catching very much fish. And finally, uh, the, the captain <laughs> says, uh, y- y'all want to put some shrimp under a, under a cork? <laughs> and I and I said, uh, sure. Why would I do that? He goes, oh, because we'll catch as many fish as you want that way. And I'm like, I've been throwing spoons for three hours. We caught four fish. Why aren't we doing the shrimp under a cork? What? And as soon as we, as soon as we put a shrimp under a cork, we're catching redfish, and we're catching, um, we're catching sea trout, and we're catching, um, you know, drumfish. I'm like having a great time. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> we we could have cut our whole fishing time like by a tenth and caught way more fish. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah it was it was amazing. Yeah, I I, oh. I don't get it. Yeah, <laughs> good times. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, fun. So those are my those are the polls we put out there. We always love getting our our fan reaction. If you're not already hanging out with us on our Facebook group, get there. Just and, we, and that's where all the action is, and uh, you'll really get close with us there. Yeah, and um, we we ought to do more of these kind of surveys. I think they're pretty great. I think so. Maybe I need to think them out a little bit further, but uh, <laughs> totally okay with me. <laughs> fish in the news. I love fish in the news. <laughs> I know you do. It's my favorite. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, this week, so we tried to find a bait-related story, right? Right. Oh, and we want to make sure that we get this right, Dave. Because uh, we did a survey of our fans, and they want the news done right. Yeah, go figure. They want truth. I know. <laughs> Remember, we are mostly truthful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we put it in our disclaimer right away. It's, it's in the subtitle. It is. So, yeah. you know, don't blame us. It's really your fault if you're upset about us getting stuff wrong. <laughs> you bastards listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> your own fault. Yeah. This one comes from news item that I found on Google News Search. Uh, from physics.org, and the title reads, Fishing Bait, Bloodworms Have Bee Sting Bites. Really? Yes. That's cool. So bloodworms, for those that fish at least up here in the Northeast, but I think probably 
probably a lot of places yeah. um, uh, in the ocean. A very popular bait, sort of like the night crawler of the ocean. Mm-hmm. Only it's a night crawler on steroids. I must right, say, right? They got like uh, I think it was legs all over, or just like just yeah. weird little appendages. Yeah, uh, I think they're probably weird appendages, pseudo yeah. pseudopods, probably. Pseudopod, huh? Uh, You're gonna get in trouble with science folks I, out there. I know. As soon as I said yeah. that, but yep. uh, anyway, yeah, these little wiggly, silly things all the way down the body. Yeah. They, they are really uh, godly hideous. Yeah, and, I mean, if you're, I mean, I would compare it more to to cilia than pseudopods, but. I wouldn't call either one of those two things. <laughs> but if really, I had, to, if I had yeah. to pick something. Yeah. You would go with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, but I'm just I'm trying to stick with your <laughs> your descriptors. I remember the first time I encountered these was in New Haven, Connecticut. Well, you're from the Midwest, right? I am. So I'd never. So the, were you shocked as a grown up the first time you see this kind of thing? You're an adult. You're like, oh my god, a working bite. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's this neon green and pink thing with like a zillion legs, totally squirmy, crawly everywhere. Yeah. So then you think, all right, all right, I can handle this. I'm a fisherman. It's bait. <laughs> Can't be that bad, right? Yeah. So then you pick it up and you're like, ah, I've, I've worked with night crawls before. I can do this. So you then you you stab it and then this <laughs> pair of jaws pops out of the front of this thing. I know. It's like tremors. <laughs> it's <just> gone. <laughs> it is. It's unbelievable. Um, and this article talks about it too. So it says the bite of a blood worm delivers venom that causes severe allergic reactions. If you're a wuss. (laughs) Scientists (laughs) studying the venom for the first time have discovered why it causes a reaction similar to that of a bee sting. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear this. All right. So a team of museum scientists studied blood worms. Mm-hmm. Small segmented worms that can grow up to 35 centimeters, which... By the way, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> small and 35 centimeters for a worm do not belong in the same sentence. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. That is, that, is, that is a big worm. Do you know what that is yeah. in translation? It must be like uh, 15 Four inches. Four feet, 10, 20 feet. No. Uh, anyway. 35 uh, centimeters. Hang on. <laughs> I'm working this out. Yeah, it's like... For yeah, it's definitely twelve feet. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, they uh, the scientists investigated the expression of venom genes, mm-hmm. and which genes were activated to produce their venom proteins. Okay. okay. A museum zoologist, Doctor Bjorn von Rudmont. What a great name! I know Bjorn von Rudmont. Bjorn. Bjorn. Yeah, interesting. By the way, I I do I do know who this doctor is. He's very famous. Daughter of is Bjork. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah. He was really disappointed she didn't get into medicine. That's right. Mm. He said we found that, or, or she's disappointed that you know she's a rock star and he's studying worms. <laughs> Probably. Either way, someone's disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we found out that some bloodworm venom toxin genes are closely related to those expressed in bee and wasp venom. So actually, the actual venom is genetically similar, which is pretty amazing when you think about how far apart these animals are in the uh, evolution. It's funny because I don't, as someone who teaches biology, I don't find that shocking. Oh, really? No, because you you see these similarities all the time. And that's when you're making a case for evolution and you're looking at, you know, from a biological point of view, all animals have similar ancestry. So you would expect these things to be similar. Mm. I mean, so I don't find it shocking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, in the article, they say blood worms commonly live in shallow tidal flats and collecting them for fishing bait is a multi-million dollar business on the East Re- Coast. Really? That's what it says. Multi-million. Okay. So I work for a nonprofit. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm not afraid of worms. Yeah. So I should quit my job and go collect worms. You should. Well, during smelt season, when you go to Suds and Soda, the local bait shop, I think they charge you like three and a half bucks for two of them, three of them. Two worms? Maybe it's six worms. It's certainly not that's a dozen. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's There are not many you get in there. That's for sure. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Um. The bloodworm venom glands also express components that are cl- more closely matched to toxins in completely different venomous creatures, such as sea anemones mm-hmm. and duck-billed platypuses. 
Really? Yes. That's cool. See, finally, you're 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 surprised. The platypi. <laughs> platypi did it, huh? Is, is it platypi? No, it's platypuses. It's like octopuses. Uh, octopuses is right. You're right. Yeah, so it's Octopi platypuses. Is, but octopuses is actually not right. O- octopodes. So is it? Oh, that's it, yeah. Yeah. So is it? Platypedes, platypedes, I don't know. Platypedes. Platypedes. Until now, scientists knew that the worms injected venom as they bite with four sharp teeth. Mm. But they were not sure exactly what the components were. But now they've figured it out. (laughs) I know it hurts. (laughs) I know it hurts. (laughs) <laughs> but I don't know why. This is where the author should wrote, uh, you know, previously scientists only responded to the venom as, ah, <laughs> son of a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody decided to figure out what they are. Well, good for them. Yeah. Blood worms will eat anything that passes by them and fits into their mouths. According to the mm-hmm. article, they catch prey. They, they evert turn inside out part of their digestive system. Ugh. And that inside out digestive system includes their teeth God. and they launch that out of the mouth. So they basically vomit teeth onto mm-hmm. their prey. Oh, nice. Isn't that wonderful? They're so cool. Yeah, they actually are pretty cool. Uh, and that pretty much, pretty much wraps up this article. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Bloodworms. So, uh, and a very common bait. So there you go. It works into our theme, fish in the news, tying into our, Bait themed podcast. It does work. And if you haven't ever held a blood worm and been bit, I highly recommend <laughs> give it a go. It is crazy. Mm-hmm. It's unreal. Thanks, Thank you. Fish and Ann. You know, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. If you were to stalk jelly from a tree and mm-hmm. uh, and shoot it while it's not looking. That's the only way I go after my jelly is when it's not looking. <laughs> it tastes tastes better when it's not afraid. You know, when, when you scare jelly before you kill it, what happens is the is the, uh, the gelatin tenses up. Oh, really? Yeah. And then it doesn't, it, it kind of gets runny after. Ugh. So you really want to make sure you sneak up on your jelly every time. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, we here at the Fish Nerds also associate with fish and hunting uh, in a couple ways. First of all, we're on the OPC. We're we're part founders, I guess. Right, outdoor podcast channel. We are we are co founders. One of seven co founders, or is it eight? I don't know. We're bad founders. We are. We, yeah, we we <laughs> sparsely affiliated, incompetent <laughs> owners of the yeah. uh, OPC, but. Uh, on that channel, there's lots of hunting channel stuff, and uh, they talk about fishing every once in a while. But I think we're the the premier fishing podcast on the OPC. Is that fair? Uh, that's fair, but also it's fair to say we're the premier fishing podcast anywhere. Oh, that's true too. Yeah, so, I don't know what premier actually means. But, <laughs> uh, but if you like hunting and fishing, uh, you ought to check out the OPC. What the OPC is is it takes these seven eight shows. We're not. 100% sure now. Um, and it just kind of puts them all on one channel. So instead of, if you're just signed up to the Fish Nerds, you get a show every week. If you sign up to the OPC, you get the Fish Nerds when it launches, but then you get um, the Big Buck Registry when it launches. You get Carrie Z's Hunt Fish Travel when it when it launches. You get seven... You get the Turkey Hunter. You get, uh, boy, there's the there's the out, Up North Journal. Yes, and there's at least there's, lots. there's at least three or four other ones that now won't talk to us uh, because we can't right. think of their names right now. But uh, <laughs> you ought to sign up to the to the channel and you'll get to hear them all. So please do that. Right. right. And speaking of fishing and hunting, yeah. Uh, this year, Dave, you and I are doing very few live appearances. Yes. Yeah. It's... Yeah. And there's there's a lot of reasons behind that. The biggest of which being is that Dave's a hermit. <laughs> I know it's the people, yeah. you know, it's yeah. that face to face thing. Yeah. But we will be uh, doing two days live at the Rockingham Expo, the Fishing and Hunting Expo, January 9th and 10th in Salem, New Hampshire. So if you're in New Hampshire or Massachusetts or Maine or Vermont that weekend and you want to come up and meet us and you want to go to a really big fishing and hunting expo, 
we'll be there. We get the front center booth. We are the biggest name in fishing in the state. <laughs> At least yeah. for the first three feet of that. For the show. first, that's right. And you know, well, we're actually, if you if you measure, Dave, uh-huh. uh, we are the highest, um, the highest booth in there. Oh, uh, yes, above sea level, uh, because our booth is up high. And it's a ramp down to the rest of the exhibits, and we are the first booth. That's right. So you could say we are above all of the other exhibitors. Uh, yes, the fish nerds are above the other exhibitors. <laughs> We look down upon them and their fate. <laughs> oh, we're making friends left and right tonight. I know. How dare you, Beta Hook? <laughs> and sour the family name. You dishonor us, sir. Yeah, there's no honor in bait. <laughs> there's no crying in baseball. <laughs> Get a job. Learn to fly fish. <laughs> but anyway, come and check us out at the Rockingham. Fishing and Hunting Expo, January 8th and 9th. Uh, and we're going to record live shows while we're there. So if you're there and you want to be on the show, we could make that happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Homemade bait traps. Homemade bait trap. Dave, do you trap bait? Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. When was the last time you did it? Oh, uh, I think this last year. I uh, I like to in the, in the summer. I like to use big shiners mm-hmm. to catch bass. A lot of times, I just catch the shiners just using a hook. But uh, every once in a while, I guess maybe it's two years ago, I'll throw a minnow trap out there and uh, yep. get them that way. Use one of those standard like mesh ones with the two cones on either end. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we thought it'd be fun uh, on this show to kind of describe how to make your own homemade bait traps. And um, we're going to give you two super, super simple ideas for bait traps. And there's a th- you can just Google them. There's a thousand on there. I'll blog about this on the Fish Nerds page, and we'll, you'll be able to see how we can do it. Um, but I do a lot of fishing with kids. And when I'm hanging out with kids, we're, we talk a lot about recycling and all that stuff. And to catch minnows, we just do the really basic minnow trap with a soda bottle. Have you done this one, Dave? Um, I have tried it, yes. Has it worked for no, you? No, it has not worked for oh, me. It works great. Oh. Uh, and even if you use small soda balls, usually a two-liter bottle is standard, but you can use this to small 20-ounce soda balls. And all you do, and it's almost like whoever made these measured them to make them work this way. <laughs> if you look at a soda bottle where the label is kind of glued on there, yeah. just take your knife. And on top of the light label, just make a cut all the way around. D- don't hurt yourself. <laughs> right. It's important yeah. you do these with uh, you know eight year old kids. Yeah. Well, get them. You know, safety scissors don't work actually with these either. <laughs> just funny. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, cut it all the way around, and then uh, that's it. You, you take the top off, poke a whole bunch of holes in it, invert the top, and stick it back in. So now you've got a funnel leading into uh, your, your bottle. Mm. Poke holes all in it, throw a handful of rocks in it to give it some weight, uh, and then you tie a string to it and throw it in the river, and fish will come in. Really? That's it. And we we did it a lot uh, last summer, uh, and we would throw we would we bait them as well. Sometimes we throw like a piece of sausage in and see what happened, or a piece of chicken leg. Uh, dog food works really great. Uh, bread works okay, and if you have dead fish, throw those in there. And they work like crazy. We got crayfish and minnows and all kinds of stuff. Wow, that's cool. The the one yeah. I tried was one of the small bottles, so it was like yeah. a twelve ounce bottle. That didn't work. No, it, it they I, we've used bottles that small and they have worked. If mm. the minnows are there, they'll come in. But they work really well, and kids love it because they get immediate results, and it doesn't cost any money. It's great. Yeah, that's great. Good tip. Good tip. So that's a good one. I'll, I'll blog about that. Super easy. Everyone knows that one. And the other one I've never actually tried, but I'm going to do this year. And that's making a leech trap. <laughs> that, that's, those, those are called shorts. Is that what they're called? Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I'm saying you wear shorts and you walk in the water and you catch leeches. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking, I was digging hard. I'm like thinking, okay, what's the joke here? I'm not. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I... <laughs> took my mother-in-law hiking right when I first got married. Oh, this will uh, be in the, good. In the White Mountains. Mm-hmm. And we did about a three-mile hike, and we found this pond out in the middle of nowhere. Right. And, uh, you know, I took my shoes and socks off, stepped in the pond, and noticed there were leeches everywhere. So I got out of the water. 
Right. And this, my mother-in-law caught up with us and she goes, oh, look at this beautiful pond. I'm going to go wade in the water. And you know, she gets very romantic and nostalgic. So she goes, isn't this beautiful? A nice day, beautiful, clean mountain pond. And she's wading barefoot in the water up to her about her, her top of her shorts there. I'm sitting on the rock laughing until I'm crying. My wife says, what are you doing? <laughs> and I say, what? I'm just watching your mom pretend the lake is the greatest thing on earth. <sighs> she goes, why are you laughing so hard? I said, because it's infested with leeches. There's thousands of them in this lake. As soon as I hit the water, I saw leeches everywhere. She goes, why, why did you let my mom go in the water? I said, because it's funny. <laughs> and then sure enough, like 12 seconds after I said that, she comes running out of the water covered in leeches and kind of yelling and making a crazy scene. And I was so happy. <laughs> and I couldn't stop laughing. And she knew when she saw me laughing that I already knew the leeches were there. And uh, yeah, I, wow. think I think I'm still in the will. And that's pre-marriage? Uh, no, I think I was just married. Oh. It's definitely wow. pre-kids. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. is amazing that you survived. A true story. Wow. So I know where the leeches live. Have you ever used leeches for bait? I have, yes. How do they do? They're fine. They they tie, they tend to spin around and try to snag onto you, but they don't they don't bore a hole in you or anything. I used them to catch walleye in a river, and they were amazing because they're really? su- super tough. And it was just boom, 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 one after another. It was awesome. Oh, so with one with one of those super tough leeches, you can get like a bunch of fish, right? Yeah. Now those were these dark black leeches, not like these really funky green and orange dot leeches we have out here. Oh, okay. Well. I've never caught a fish on a leech mm. and I've, I've never used them. That's probably why. So, <laughs> yeah. so I intend this summer to do it and, and making a leech trap is super duper easy too. Yeah. Have you done this? Have you made one? No, no. You, you take a tin can with a lid um, of some sort and you can probably just take a coffee can with a plastic lid Yeah. and you use your church key can opener and punch a bunch of holes in it. And then you take uh, dead stuff. The, the guy on the YouTube video I watched today was using, like I said, he was using muskrats. Oh, God. But uh, I've, I know people who do chicken livers and things like that. Throw it in there with some rocks, tie a string around it, put it where leeches live, and they'll come in to eat that meat. Wow. And he's, he, I was reading online, and people say it's about an hour, hour and a half, and you should have like dozens of leeches. Leeches are amazing in their ability to find prey i mean they they will swim i've been in those kind of small ponds and uh they're aggressive they i think they even see you it's crazy i uh, yeah they gotta eat man yeah and they and when you're in a pond that doesn't get a lot of you know mother-in-laws they get really <laughs> <laughs> really aggressive they so. do they do gosh yeah so. i don't know i'm i'm a kind of afraid to, to use them but i'm gonna do it <laughs> Down in the rainforest, I've seen this, not personally, but, you know, on TV. And um, they, uh, the rainforest are so wet and everything, the, the leeches are out on land. Ugh. And they, uh, they'll they track you down. They'll they'll smell you and track you down while you're walking through the jungle. Mm. Yeah. That's... You're in the jungle, baby. You're going to die. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. very, very good. <laughs> That is it. That's it. You've listened to a couple of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that middle-aged guys do. If you would like to support the fish nerds, go to fishnerdnation.com and buy some effing swag. We've got decals, we've got hats, we've got beanies, and we have just two best left. So get in there, buy our crap. <laughs> Special thanks to all our Fish Nerd fans on the Fish Nerds podcast group. You know who you are. And to Matt Borowski of Zombait for his... Ooh, ooh. Brains. His brains. <laughs> really appreciate him talking to us about his new invention, Zombait. And until next time... Follow the code of the fish nerd, spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a pie.
podcast. Just for the hell of it. Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast.